Hello fellow future enthusiasts, on Demystifying we do deep dives on science, futurism, and speculative technology. My name is Thor, and I will be your host today. Access diffusion has always been considered with a speculative lens, as if the achievement were always out of arm's reach. Is this still the case? The first controlled thermonuclear fusion in the lab occurred at Los Alamos in 1958. In 1974, the first successful laser-induced fusion was achieved by KMS Fusion, a private company. In 2014, the National Ignition Facility produced more energy from fusion than what was absorbed by the fuel. This still demanded more laser energy than was produced because of problems with the efficient energy transfer to the laser media. December 5th, 2022. Humans achieved the first controlled nuclear fusion reaction producing more output power than was used to initiate the fusion cascade at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. The method of fusion used at the NIF is laser inertial confinement, using a technique known as indirect drive. This method involves two hemispheres of lasers, 192 in total, focused around a small fuel pellet at the center of the chamber. Instead of being focused on the fuel pellet itself, the lasers converge on the walls of the HALROM, a diamond tube holding the fuel material. The question everyone wants an answer to is whether this moment means commercial fusion is a clear reality. Many reporters have already appeared downplaying the significance of the ignition event, including some of the most viewed creators on this platform. To downplay this event is to ignore the trajectory of fusion research entirely, and makes no sense. I think the best way to answer this question without clouding the issue with matters of expectation and pride is interestingly in an analogy contained in a statement from DARPA about the discovery, posted to their DARPA e-web blog on December 13th. When we apply a match to a stick of wood, we anticipate far more energy from the burning stack of wood than the input energy carried by the match across the threshold of the fireplace. Similarly, in the NIF's recent experiment, the energy released from the fusion fuel, the wood stack, exceeded the laser energy, the match, passing into the vacuum vessel chamber, the fireplace. And I think this is the best possible analogy. The issue we face now is that our match is very expensive to produce. All that is needed is a more economical and efficient match. The issue of maintaining a flame is no longer holding us back. The post continues, quite seriously, that it is not an exaggeration to claim that this result is equal in importance to the earliest achievement of controlled fire by our ancient ancestors. At an unknown time in the distant past, an individual released more energy from burning wood than the input energy of sparks leaping from their flint stones. This ability to bring forth fire at will is the first step towards human sophisticated control of chemical combustion. Similarly, we expect this demonstration of scientific energy gain in a fusion experiment, as well as rapidly progressing work in other areas of fusion research and development, to open the pathway towards the utilization of fusion energy in the production of clean, on-demand economical heat and electricity. DARPA has major decades-long investments into fusion, so they clearly understand the implications of what's happened. Without unearthing the entire tract of fusion's complex past, the constant theme has been fusion's ability to elude our concept of scale and application. The dimensions of the fusion reactor relative to the power density needed to achieve fusion was always in question, leading to large and powerful fusion reactors even for testing. See the tokamak. The success of the NIF was not due to using an enormous amount of energy, even though it did. The experiment consumed some 2 megajoules to sustain 20 billionths of a second of fusion, netting just over 1 megajoule of produced energy from the fuel. The engineering of the laser ignition system allows this feat to be accomplished. By focusing a large number of pulsed lasers at the walls of a diamond cylinder surrounding the fusion material, powerful X-rays and expanding diamond vapor were produced around the fusion target, rapidly compressing and heating it. This allowed enough energy to be transmitted to the fuel before instabilities in the fusion process could occur, producing around 1 megajoule of net power. Note that the laser energy of 2 megajoules required more than 2 megajoules of electrical energy due to the inefficiency of the lasers. 
and this is where people in the science communication field have gotten caught up. Yes, you require more than 2 megajoules of electrical energy. However, the rate of energy transfer efficiency to both the laser media and also the fuel pellet will affect this figure. Researchers currently understand that about 1% of energy is transferred to the fuel pellet using the indirect drive method. This could be increased to 5% fairly easily using direct drive, and this method is being proposed by the lead researcher at the NIF. In actual commercial designs, the top priority will be increasing efficiency of energy transfer to the laser and to the fuel pellet. Either way, the net positive represents that inertial confinement fusion is extremely close to demonstrating a working commercial fusion system. So close that all they need to create such a facility is the direction to do so. The success of the NIF will begin to shape the landscape of fusion, since many ongoing projects like the ITER Tokamak have been long considered the best option for research. Research Tokamaks exist all over the world and have been a long-time standard for fusion testing, but this reality may begin to change since these devices are typically large and use more energy. They also have more presence as a source of EM interference, but they have the upside of allowing for extended periods of fusion. A longer fusion time means fewer reactions are needed to supply consistent power, which is important considering our ability to store energy is limited in commercial applications. I don't think the success of laser inertial confinement will end the legacy of the tokamak. In fact, I think this event will provide the impetus needed for large-scale commercial tokamaks and other fusion methods to be taken seriously and prioritized in science. The Department of Energy has not yet funded a program to develop inertial confinement fusion, but this event should compel some government organizations to take note. I think this reality paints a very vivid picture of why people are thinking the way that they do about this topic. The most relevant government agency, the Department of Energy, does not seem interested in nuclear fusion, but maybe this will change. I think that this fact has painted a biased image of institutional reception to fusion, leading some to believe that commercial application is still so far in the future that it's not worth considering. In reality, our governments simply have not seized onto the opportunity, and once they do, it's just a matter of time before commercial fusion reaches the forefront. With any major discovery, a countless number of new doors are open to human civilization. Fusion may be one of the most significant discoveries in human history, and will no doubt open many doors for the inhabitants of planet Earth. I didn't think this issue could be divisive, but here we are. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Leave a like, subscribe, and drop a comment with any thoughts you have. Have a good evening, and we'll see you in the next video.